All right, guys. Today, we're going to have a quick conversation about Bitcoin. I just wanted to cover the charts. I wanted to cover some fundamentals of what's happening in the last week and uh, just really focus on what I think is happening and also encourage people to not be aggressive on selling positions. I get that CleanSpark went up 33% on Friday. I get that Bitcoin is above 48,000 and it feels like a good time to take profits. But unlike some other companies I talked about recently, like Palantir, this is just the beginning of what happens in the Bitcoin cycle. And there are so many good reasons why we could go a lot higher, a lot higher from here over the next one and a half years. And we will reach overbought conditions. We're currently there right now. If you look down here, on the weekly, we are overbought, but this is Bitcoin overbought, and Bitcoin overbought can be a really weird thing. If I zoom out here a little bit, you can see that overbought conditions in 2017, and I think we have an event that's like 2017. I think this is going to be a crucial thing to explain. Looks like one of my lines got crooked here. I got to fix that. My having line, a little bit off. I'll just straighten you out a hair. I'll have to line that up later. Uh, that's pretty close, though. Um, anyway, what I wanted to point is the RSI down here. You can see overbought conditions can extend for long periods of time. And overbought turns into the 80s and 90s on the RSI, which is stupid. But you can see where we got to 83 here not too long ago before basically taking a sideways break. If we zoom in here, we took we didn't really we didn't really melt down at all. We're back above this next fib. I, I was talking about a week or so ago, two weeks ago even about how we stood a chance of breaking above this fib, and if we could establish support above that, um, how just like we did here, where we essentially just blew right through it, the fact that we grinded underneath of this, and now we're above all peak volumes in the history of Bitcoin, is such a crucial thing to understand. Now, don't get me wrong, we're overbought. Maybe we grind up here a little bit further, to, uh, I think the the home, a real good home would be 53,000, right in between all volumes, right? We're in between these volume shelves. So I think we could bounce between where we are now in the 48,000 range up to 55, 56 uh, in the coming weeks heading into the halving event, which is only like 60, 67 days away. Let's take a look here. How far away are we from the halving? 66. Wow. Crazy. We have less than a week and we'll have less than a month. Just nuts. Just nuts. Anyway, so we're above this now and I love that. And I would encourage people, the biggest mistake, and I posted about this recently, the biggest mistake I made in 2017 was selling too quickly and then running back in and chasing. Um, to a lesser degree, I did that this last cycle in the 2020s, 2021 range. But I did a similar thing, right? Like I was, I was actually pretty good. If you look over here, I didn't really start to sell until maybe like here. And then I sold a little bit up here. And then I sold some more here. We had this big dip. I bought into that. I was really smart about this time frame. We went back up. I thought we were going higher like everybody. I ignored global liquidity. I ignored the fact that the Fed said that they were going to tighten rates at the most aggressive rate in history. So I went down. Um, but then when we bounced back up and got into the 40s again, and we were right up about here. I sold out of a huge amount of my position. Over over here, it might have been here or here, I was completely out of miners. Um, that's the first thing I dial out of. And it's what I would encourage you guys to do too. When you think you've reached that peak, and I don't think our peak is until 150 or 288 this cycle. It's up over here, right? Because our measured move, what I believe is occurring right now, um, gets us up closer to this range. Um, Actually, it probably gets us right about to here. But I do think that judging by the previous resistance lines, we're gonna, we normally we would have diminishing returns because we have um, economies of scale, right? When you have the law of large numbers indicates that the bigger you get, that it's harder to get bigger. This is like one of the arguments I was using against Meta and some of these other companies recently. Even though I got to say, Meta is probably one that could go up a decent amount. Um they definitely have the room to. They have so much net income. It's stupid. Just so much extra money. I mean, they're doing dividends now. But anyway, I digress. My whole point is I, I would normally say, hey, we should get diminished returns. We shouldn't hit this red line. But then we have so many other factors that we'll talk about in a little bit here that are prevailing and powerful. And I think that they're going to drive us a lot higher. Anyway, 
So we're above this FIB level. Uh, the FIB is right about the 46-ish range. So if we stay above that and establish support and just grind sideways, I think we're ready for launch. And I think the next zone, like I said, if we go in here and we zoom in a little bit closer, let's get a lot closer here. If we get in a lot closer and look at all previous volume up in this range, this is a nice home. The 52-ish, 52 53 range is a nice little home to sit in and then just kind of bounce around between here before attempting to take out 57. And then it's then it's the king king fib, 65.5 or 65.5 to about that 69 range. So that that will be <laughs> that'll be God mode. Once we get above this next fib, once we get above this next fib, it's over. It's just over. That's when the FOMO is in full gear. That's when the technical analysts from all around the world, even if they don't like Bitcoin, they're going to jump into this game. So we've got a limited amount of time, 66 days. Uh, we're above. We've got one more fib after this, and it's game over. It's it's We're rock and roll. So be smart. Get involved before that. A couple weeks ago, actually for the last several weeks, I've been saying that I think that we'll, we'll start to go up into this resistance zone again. And I should actually just re I'm going to kill this. I'm going to kill this totally or move it around because really this has changed a lot over time. It should be up before we had some resistance I saw over here, but I don't even count that anymore. Really, we don't start to peak in volumes till right about here. So I'm going to put that as our resistance zone now. And then it's a matter of getting above this fib. That's the real big deal. And you know what? We'll draw it up. We'll draw it up to here. This is this is all going to be resistance. And I think this next, if we have, if this downward resistance line has anything to say about it, we're really going to hit here and probably stop. And then we're looking at altcoin season and that will get crazy. Altcoin season can just fly, just fly. So definitely be ready for that. Um, it's going to be nuts. But Bitcoin dominance is looking strong and I don't see it slowing down any soon, anytime soon. Oh, I did want to say, We've obviously got some bearish divergence here in the RSI and uh, the MACD potentially on the weekly time frame. But look, if you look here at the MACD, though, if we zoom in, the, the thing I want to note, let's see, there we go, is that we we got close here and then we started going higher again. And that's a key that's a key point with the MACD is the fact that it doesn't want to cross underneath and start form, forming a downward trend. So, again, I think the biggest thing that happens is sideways chop and then going higher into the halving. Uh, and I think before... People are talking about 69,000 numbers. Adam Beck, an OG and somebody who I have a ton of respect for, he's talking about 100,000. I don't know if it's going to be that, but again, we'll talk about some of the pluses that are really going to drive this thing higher. I'm going to refresh this just to make sure we're still 68, 66. All right, so by this clock, the Bitcoin having this is my favorite. We're getting close to 65 days. Ooh, time's ticking. All right, a couple key things to note here. On the left, we have the GBTC daily flows. You can see how they became massively negative. And this is what threw me off. I just didn't do it. I didn't, I didn't quantify the math well enough to understand. Again, it was a sell the news event. My friend, uh, Income Sharks, he's very smart. He was one of the only people saying, guys, you're being stupid. It's going to be a sell the news event when the halving happens. You'll, you'll see. And uh, I ignored his warnings. I said, I kind of like, well, yeah, yeah, that could happen. But he was spot on. That's exactly what it was. It was a sell the news event. And it was a sell the news event for a reason. Part of that was I thought that we would have inflows into these new ETFs and that would be the primary driving factor. That was not the primary driving factor. The outflows of people getting out of GBTC created so much downward pressure that the inflows coming into it just couldn't keep up. Couldn't keep up. And we were just kind of near a market cycle peak too. Um, again, that the, the regular indices started to have price pressure around there too. So it kind of made sense that, okay, the market general markets are taking a breather. We're seeing massive outflows of people getting out of GBTC. If they could, if they could, and it was easy to move, like they have an IRA account here in the States um, where it's a retirement account that they don't get penalized from a tax perspective, then it was smart for them to get out of that and not pay 1.3%, whatever it is for their fee per year. And instead, move into one um, that has no fees for like six months, like an IBIT, a BlackRock one. I don't love them. I'd rather be in Fidelity. They've been OGs for the crypto space for a long time. They've been advocates for Bitcoin for a long time, going back to 2015, I think, or something. 
I'd rather be in the Fidelity Fund than IBIT with BlackRock. I don't like the big dogs. I don't like the way they play. Anyway, but the whole point was those outflows were strong. And until they started to break down, until these inflows into the new spot Bitcoin ETFs started to pick up, we just haven't seen that much up, upside price pressure. But again, the flows really started to change the end of January. And if we go back and look at Bitcoin's price action here, um, at right about the end of January, boy, can you see that difference, man. So lots of good stuff with these ETFs. Lots of good stuff. All right, so I want to hop over here. Um, if you guys haven't seen this, I think I have this shared out too in my um, pin profile where I have a bunch of information about all my charts and links to them with my live charts. So I share this stuff out. So if you guys want to see them in real time as I update them or if you think something hasn't been updated, you can go to my pin profile and see that. And I'll just show you real quick. So right here, I show my portfolio allocation. I indicate when it's been updated. And then down here a ways, you can see, again, all the charts that I'm focused on. There's a couple I need to update in here. But essentially, if you just go into here, you can pull up the chart. It's a shared version. It's a current version. Anything I've updated is right there for you. And in case you didn't know, here's my current portfolio allocation. Some of these show a 0%. They're not, but it's just not enough money. Um, I think even like thirty or $40,000 or something. I don't even know if that's enough to get a percent on here. Um, so I ordered anything under 25 is not enough to get a percent. Now, uh, CLSK. CLSK has become a huge part of my portfolio. PayPal was the biggest holding I had. I haven't actually added that much to PayPal. I did after the steep drop, but these miners have just skyrocketed so much that I'm sitting closer to 50% right now. Um, let's see here, 22, 34, 34, 40, 46. Yeah, about 50% when you add up just you know all these little funds that I hold too. So I'm, I, a large amount of my money is in uh, is in Bitcoin and related investments right now. But yeah, if you want to see this chart, the, I wanted to highlight this. This is my long-term BLX chart. And what I love about this one is that it goes out over a very, very long period of time, right? You can see I've got price action from 2010. Not a lot of people have Bitcoin price action from 2010. Um, but I find this to be valuable because it shows how we have these downward moves, Um up into the halving and then we have this breakthrough moment and you can see this this hasn't been updated in a very long time we're getting ready to already break through what i calculated as the next one and you can see so steeper less steep less steep less steep that's what i'm doing right i'm using the laws of large numbers um, and the growth of the network to determine that we're going to have a less steep um, incline and decline and so you get this move where it starts to flatten out a little bit as we get larger so that's how I was able to calculate this and it was a rough calculation but you can see how it's played out really right because we're about to break through it right now um, and turn this into um, and turn this into potentially support and a launch pad for our next targets and my next targets again are 150 to about 280 and we're going to go into why I think some of that is right now uh, in this post so why are we going to do so well? Global liquidity is much stronger and it's ramping. It's ramping because China, I mean, there's conversations about a need for $1.4 trillion to stimulate their economy. It's lunar, it's, it's uh, the year of the dragon, which I think Tom Lee was talking about, performs better than average. Um, and then at the same time, it's the lunar new year. So over the short term, we're getting a lot of benefits from China uh, needing to inject capital and from them just having one of their highest spending points of the year. Lunar New Year is huge for them. It's like a couple weeks where they, they have time off from work, at least a week. I can't remember exactly. Um, but they have time off from work. They're traveling all around the country. They're spending a ton of money. If there's a time where people are going to spend money, it's right now. Um, as you know, I'm not super positive on China's economy. I think it's going through a downward spiral and it's a free fall. But the narrative will be strong this time of year. It's strong every every time. Um, even during pandemics, it's still strong around this time of year. So people have faith that things are going to be good. And so I think that helps general broader markets. I think also we're going to see capital outflows from China. Uh, I'm going to be doing a China related video and I'll talk about some of that. Uh, I don't know if I'll get it out today. I'm also going to do a tax video today. It's tis the season. It's coming up. If you haven't already filed your taxes, if you're doing a lot of trading, there's stuff I want to make sure everybody knows since my the, the group has grown so much. Um, in the last, you know, year, I, I went from having a couple hundred followers on X to having 48,000. 
and uh, and then on YouTube, you know, I'm I'm pushing towards eight now, and so from a from a channel that was almost non-existent three uh, you know three weeks ago, so um, so I want I want to make sure that people understand taxes as well. So we're gonna go over that in another video, but I'll try and get these out because you need to understand this stuff. But anyway, premise here: very positive start to the year, right? Positive start to the year, even though indices are oversold, including big are overbought, including Bitcoin. Um, I think that the liquidity narrative and just actual liquidity is going to be really strong at the beginning of the year and throughout the year. Uh, Fed reducing rates. Again, this is a net positive for risk on. Uh, if you look at small caps, you'll see that they were crushed. Um, actually, let me pull them up real quick. And this is the this is worse than China. I'm not going to pull up China charts. They're so bad. But um, if you look here, this is over a long period of time. This is the monthly. So let's go to the weekly. S we're looking at trade levels that aren't much higher than they were in 2018 on small caps. Um, this is a big deal, right? So if we look here, small caps are up 14% since 2018. So let's see, one, two, three, six years, six years, um, over six years that, that, that it's only went up 14%, and that's just not great. And again, some of this, I mean, just going back, it's basically been flatlined going back to February 2021. So we're looking at, you know, three years worth of data here where this thing has just not went anywhere, almost three years. And so this, it's overdue for small caps to do well. And and again, the reason that they got crushed is very similar to other markets in 20, late 2021, this thing was kind of grinding and reaching tops anyways. If we look at the, you know, the RSI, it was very overbought. <clears throat> so it was due for some sideways chop. It wanted to go higher, but the Fed started hiking at the most aggressive rates in history. And you can see what that did to this market. Now, again, small businesses, why does that happen? Small businesses are very dependent upon low interest rates. And they were especially in the super low interest rate environment that we were in. So they got crushed. Um, risk on gets crushed when you go from having almost 0% rates to having the, the fastest rate and highest rate in history um, over a short period of time. So you just, you're, you're gonna have small businesses get crushed. You're gonna have risk on get crushed. That's why all the SPACs, the meme coins, everything get, just dissolved into dust, right? So that is changing though. That's the thing I'm trying to get across right now. That's changing come March or May, unless you see here currently what the Fed Watch tool is telling us. Um, come March or May, May is, I want to refresh because sometimes this doesn't auto refresh for some reason. So let's see, March, only a 16% chance, very low, very low chance of lowering rates. I think that that could change because we still have two major economic reads coming between now and early, uh, mid March when, when, or I'm sorry, late March, March 20th, when we're looking at making a decision on lowering rates. So I think that this percentage will go up. I still can't guarantee that we're going to lower rates in March, but I think the narrative will become strong. And so again, I think small caps will benefit from that. Companies like Tesla and Enphase that, that are really interest rate dependent because they're the auto sector or, or buying huge solar panels, but taking out loans to get stuff, right? That's the gist. Um, the mortgage sector, real estate will do a lot better once we start lowering rates. And so we're going to see vast improvement in that area. But for May, we already have a 61% roughly chance of lowering at least 25 BIPs, if not 50. So 0.25% or 0.5%. They call it BIPs, whatever. It's just terms that they like to say so they sound smarter than you. But my whole point is, so I think we're going to go risk on here soon. In a major way, I think we could go risk on if the economy doesn't fall apart. If unemployment doesn't skyrocket, which I don't think it will, and I've got a narrative about that I still need to talk about, I need to do another macro section se uh, session too. So taxes, next video. Uh, video after that, probably China. Another video talking about macro or maybe inverse, and I'll do macro and then China. But I'm hoping to get that stuff out really quick. If nothing else, by Monday, I want to have all these videos out um, so that we can get a really good bead on just everything, right? You got to understand everything. People that just talk TA, that just talk charts, they're only giving you part of the picture. They're not telling you the true story. So make sure that you think about all of it, the fundamentals, the macro, and the TA. Very important stuff. Now, okay, so we've got so we got the Fed reducing rates. Great. Global liquidity increasing. Great. China spending a bunch of money. Outflows coming out of China. I'll see that in another video. Great. These are all positive things, right, that will help Bitcoin's price. Then we have the FASB accounting rules that went into effect 
They actually don't, they're not forcibly going into, into effect until the end of the year. That's why I didn't catch this earlier. I didn't read the nuance of what was happening with this, with this uh, accounting rule change. But people can start using it this year. That's the part I didn't get. Um, I didn't understand that that was happening right away. So that's why CleanSpark crushed it. That's why they're up, you know, a huge amount, just stupid amounts of money in a short period of time. Let's just pull them up real quick <laughs> just to give perspective of how powerful this accounting rule change is for miners. CleanSpark was, everybody was giving up on miners again. And and again, I wasn't super optimistic about miners because I just didn't know how low they were going. I knew that they could, that they were starting to bottom in here. And uh, I said that they could bottom or they could continue to get, honestly, I was leaning towards for a while there, getting crushed going into the halving before FASB. And this is why I made a video like two, two days, I think it was Thursday. Thursday afternoon, I made a video about, you have to watch this video right away when I realized what, what had happened with FASB, maybe it was Thursday or Wednesday. It was when uh, CleanSparks earnings had come out. And then I started to look at their accounting. And then I realized that it was this rule that had went into effect. And so I was trying to get people to watch that before we went up 33%. At one point, we were up almost 40% um, in CleanSpark in a day. But you could see here over a period of three weeks, CleanSpark is up 125%. And they're up because of this accounting rule change made such a massive difference. Let me just pull this up real quick. It made such a massive difference in what everything looks like. You can see their Bitcoin production wasn't much better. Hash rate was higher, but difficulties went up, so it wasn't great. But look at revenue. Look at revenue, and then look at net income, and then look at their cash to debt, and then their operating expenses are going down. This company just fired on a lot of cylinders. Total cost uh, per Bitcoin mine went down. But again, the net income difference here a lot of that in the revenues looking so great is because of these accounting rules and the fact that they've changed and the way that they report these things now are more positive and beneficial. And so you have this benefit. This isn't just for Bitcoin miners, guys. Uh, MicroStrategy shot up a ton last week too and gapped up. And so what I'm trying to get across here is that this is very important because now companies like Tesla, small amount of theirs, it's not really going to impact them. But companies that wanted to, to previously hold Bitcoin on their on their um, balance sheet <clears throat> to offset potential risk with the dollar, um, just currency exchange rate concerns could take 5% of their corporate um, balance sheet <clears throat> and put it into Bitcoin so that they can offset, you know, potential risks of war. Um, and then also, again, just inflationary money printing. And these are real concerns, and smart CFOs understand these are real concerns. And now they're realizing that, hey, Bitcoin is recognized here. We've got ETFs approved in the United States, which is like the stamp from the U.S. government that, hey, this is okay. And then now, I talk about it briefly in here, we have um, South Korea and, and Hong Kong looking at Bitcoin ETFs this year. And I think at least in South Korea, they were talking to Gary Gensler, and I think the chance of that happening is like, 95, 99%. And in Hong Kong, I believe it's about 70 to 80. Um, those markets are more opaque because they're Chinese. Um, and you just don't know what to believe. And again, that it could dissolve. That could go from 70 to 80 to like 10% overnight um, with one crazy roll from the CCP. But my whole point is, again, we have, this, we have the macro setup powerful with global liquidity and Fed reducing rates doing the inverse of what happened in 2021, which is looking to push the price a lot higher. So 2021, what did it do? Boom. Now we haven't even started raising rates yet or lowering rates yet, and this is ready to take off. And so we have that going into effect. And then at the same time, um, let me get back over here. Um, so we have that going into effect with the Fed reducing rates, global liquidity being high. We have our Bitcoin ETFs. Then we have ETFs that are getting ready to spin up in other places. And the ETFs are so important because now fund managers like BlackRock are advertising this stuff to their client base. Whereas before they were like, oh, stay away. It's not safe. And now they're like, buy it. It's the it's digital gold 2.0. It's the greatest hedge against a scary world. And, and you have massive funds and even little funds starting to pitch Bitcoin now. Whereas before they wouldn't touch it because the only way you could get access was through GBTC, which is an OTC trade that's over the counter trade. And you can't even just do a market order, which means you just click the button and say you want to buy how many shares. You had to do paper trades, which means you got to set a limit order 
and then other people have to agree to it. You have to adjust that. It's just a horrible way to do business in comparison. And then it's not even, it wasn't even tied to the price of Bitcoin. So we had went from having a massive premium where it was w worth way more than it should have versus what they held for their Bitcoin holdings in 2017, 18, 19, 20. And then it went negative. And so then the benefits we were getting from that trade where people could buy this, leave it locked in that fund for six months and then make a sweet ass premium. All that stuff went away. But anyway, so so you had this horrible construct where, where it wasn't a Bitcoin ETF and it wasn't easily traded and it wasn't something that people could purchase in funds to being available. And then with the FASB rules now, you have corporations that can custody Bitcoin, not just these Bitcoin miners that will see profitability. And it's just nuts. It's just nuts. And then we have the halving coming up in 66 days. This is just a rocket ship set up for launch. I don't know how many more ways I can try and emphasize that. Um, let's see if we can find more. Again, just another way to show the massive inflows that are happening right now. Again, my prediction of the next level here on Bitcoin just said, hey guys, um, we could see 69 before the halving. And I'm not joking when I say that. This is crazy times that we're in right now. Um, I have this post right here. What does it say? Some people argue that Bitcoin was not a good inflation hedge in 2021, uh, but I argue quite the opposite. Um, it was just early. And I do agree with that. Um, if you look here, you could see how the, you could see how the inflation rate started to increase, right? Inflation was kicking in, but look at what Bitcoin did. Bitcoin front started to front run it, and look at it peaked early, right here. Look, it peaked early before inflation did, and then they started talking about lowering rates, and then it got crushed like general markets did, and then the Fed funds rate started going up, and so you could see how. Bitcoin started to hear that rates were going to go down and they're like, oh, okay, well, whatever. We obviously have to start exiting this trade. The top's been neutered and the stock market started to do this maybe a little bit later, maybe right about here. And, and then the Fed started to raise rates, but then they stopped, right? Then they stopped and leveled out. And what has Bitcoin done since then? So again, I just think Bitcoin's early. Like most things, it's so liquid. It's 24 hours, 24 seven. 365 days a week. It's early. It's always early, guys. If you want to know what's happening with other markets, you can usually look at Bitcoin and see whatever it's doing, the general markets are probably going to do next. Uh, let me see here. Yeah, again, there's another. I don't have my post in here. I should. So <clears throat> I had some math in here, and I'd have to find the post. I wish I would have put it in here. But that post basically indicated that we're consuming Bitcoin, and this is a number I got from uh, James and Best Answers too, at 10 times the daily issuance rate, right? That is so insane because if we're consuming Bitcoin at 10, 10 times the issuance rate, if the price didn't move at all and demand maintained, so 10 days for every one day um, is what we end up consuming in these Bitcoin ETFs, just the Bitcoin ETFs. That's not corporations going, huh, should we add this to our balance sheet? That's just the ones in the United States picking it up. That's not one the ETFs that are already in Canada and Europe, the one that's going to fire up in South Korea, the ones that could find it fire up in Hong Kong. That's just right now. And then at the halving, if the price didn't move at all, that would be 20 days supply for every day. And the numbers just start to get insane when you look at that. Um, they start to get insane. I don't know if I could find it in here. It's so far down. But um, but the numbers, if you think about 20 days of supply being consumed in one day, in one month, that's 600 days of supply being consumed in one day. And it's just the numbers get so much more crazy. I'm trying to see if I can find this here. It's such a great, great little bit of analytics. But essentially, maybe I can't find it. But essentially, you have 600 days of supply being consumed in a month. You have almost a decade being consumed in a, in, in a half a year. And that doesn't include the fact that you can't really say it's a decade because every four years, we, get, we cut in half again. So we're going from about 900 Bitcoin a day right now down to 450 Bitcoin in April a day. 
And then after that, it will drop even further down to 225 after four years. So really at the rate, if the price didn't change at all, a little over six, six to eight months from now, we will have consumed 30 years roughly of new supply coming into the Bitcoin markets because of the fact that you have the halving cutting it every four years. And so it just keeps pushing that number up. So we just have explosive upside, guys. So explosive. I don't want to go much longer here. Um, how long are we? 30 minutes. This is a long one. So, but um, again, I think that the worst case we have right now is sideways chop. And then it's off to the races in such a massive way. Don't be left behind. Don't ignore all the stuff I just talked about in here. Um, don't ignore the massive inflows and the reduction in outflows in GBTC. Don't ignore global liquidity and what's happening with that. Don't ignore the Fed getting ready to lower rates at the latest in May, kicking off what I believe to be one of the greatest risk on environments we've seen in modern times. Don't ignore the ETFs. Don't ignore the accounting rule changes. Don't ignore corporations thinking about putting this on their balance sheet. Don't ignore the new ETFs that haven't even come on yet. Be smart. This is when you FOMO. If you're going to FOMO, you do it now. You should have done it back here, but not everybody got in at in the 15s, okay? Not everybody got in in the 15s. Everybody's scared down here. I was buying here. Smart people that knew the fundamentals of Bitcoin were buying here. Most people weren't buying here. They should have been buying here when we were above key peak volumes and it looked like we had an ascending triangle. But whatever. I'm not, I'm not, you de if you're not in, if you don't have exposure, my God, are you going to do it at 150,000? Is that really when you're going to get in? With miners, you can get two to four X the underlying asset. If we only made it to 150,000, you could make four X to eight, 10 X. Easy, easy. And again, Clean Spark is my favorite. That's the one you want. But just don't don't miss the ride, guys. This is such an easy way. I made 700% in 2023. I made that from identifying asymmetric returns, understanding macro, and making sure to follow it. I knew global liquidity was ramping at the beginning of 2023 because I follow Mike Howell and Cross Border Capital and other sources that monitor this stuff. I knew that the Fed was done hiking rates because I follow trueflation and I get real-time data and don't listen to the Fed's bullshit. And I look at the fundamentals and I look at the TA and I understand where we're at with things. And when you when you look at that comb combination, you can be right for short periods of, or wrong short periods of time, but you're right over the long periods of time. And so I highly encourage you use that methodology and find assets that are undervalued and that want to scream. And this is one, this wants to scream. This is one of the best assets ever invented in humanity. And people that tell you that, that that's not true and that have been saying that for years are idiots. They're idiots. They're stupid people. They're stupid people that don't understand how much money can be made from this. They don't understand the value of it. And over the course of, let's just go back here, since 2018, they certainly haven't made the amount of money that I've made. They haven't made 1,400%. They haven't made 1,400%. And if you rode these waves well, you could have done even better than that. I did. So don't listen to idiots. Don't listen to Peter Schiff. He's an idiot. Or at least he's so arrogant and so locked in his ways that he has given up on new things. And old minds, whether they're young or old, are not the people you should be listening to. You should be listening to people that are wise. You should be listening to people that look at the whole picture. And you should be li listening to people that look towards the future and can identify it. Both within technology, with politically, uh, environmentally, um, in every aspect. I'm done ranting. I do that a lot. I apologize. Um, love you guys. Uh, I'll, like I said, I'm going to work on that tax video next. And, uh, and then I'll work on China and then I'll work on macro. We'll get all this stuff out, I promise. Um, that way you're nice and prepared for the beginning of the week. Anyway, you guys have a great day. I'll talk to you in the next video. Bye.